Alchemical and Chemical Alkalis, a short essay by Bruce Mills, otherwise known as The Obligate Pedestrian. Part of my intention with this essay series is to expand on the principle that to understand early science one has to learn the language and culture of the early scientists. If one simply does not know the language, for example, ancient Greek is all Greek to me, then one cannot read what they said. And that may lead to missing part of the history, but if the language is, for example, 17th century English, then it can be highly misleading to a native English speaker who might think that they are getting the gist of it, but actually be getting entirely the wrong idea, because the meaning of the words themselves has changed. My own guide to understanding history is that if I ever think that people of some previous century were ignorant monkeys, then I assume that I have not really understood their world. People of centuries past were dealing with their time just as we deal with ours. They were not, on the whole, any more stupid than we are, and our education fails to explain their world almost as much as theirs failed to explain ours. Indeed, if there is a change in intelligence over the centuries, it seems that intelligence is going down. This is not a lament about children these days, but rather a statement that there is evidence that indicators of intelligence of individuals of human species have been dropping since the advent of civilization, as the group knowledge becomes more important than the individual knowledge. This is something that bothers me, but it makes perfect sense from an evolutionary perspective. Why use up your own resources being smart when society will tell you what to do, in fact will punish you if you don't? And that also applies to those who think that being political means being smart. They too are just playing the role handed to them by society at large. They do not have a special transcendent understanding of the world. So now we look at the language of the 18th century. This is the century of phlogiston and the dramatic increase in the number of different airs and the development of the theory of combustion, corrosion, acids and alkalis it ended with the work of Lavoisier, which is often said to have ushered in the age of true chemistry. That last conclusion is mostly semantics. The 19th century was ruled by classical chemistry that replaced chemistry, that replaced alchemy, and that was replaced in the 20th century by quantum chemistry. Each of the past several centuries has been marked by a characteristic form of material studies. In the Chambers Cyclopedia, 1728, Volume 1, page 62, ALK, alkali, alkali, or alkali, in chemistry, a name originally given by the Arabians to a salt extracted from the ashes of a plant called by them kali, and by us glasswort, because it is used in the making of glass, see kali and glass. Afterwards, the term alkali became a common name for lixivious salts of all plants, that is, for such salts as are drawn by lotion from their ashes, see lixivious and ashes. And hence again, in regard of the original alkali, it was found to ferment with acids. The name has since become common to all volatile salts and all terrestrial substances which have that effect, see acid. Alkali, then, in its modern extensive sense, is any substance which being mixed with an acid, an ebullition and effervescence ensues thereon, see effervescence, etc., and hence arises the grand division of natural bodies into two opposite classes, acids and alkalis, see acids. End of quote. In chambers, acid is defined in the original sense as being that which tastes sharp on the tongue. Acids are things that taste sour. This refers the idea to the human senses, which are always the ultimate source of information in science. By the 20th century, smell, taste, touch and hearing have become rather less common, and only vision is typically used in the 21st century to identify chemicals. One does not usually hear, in chemistry, wait until the solution stinks. The eyes are both the most detailed sense organs and also the ones that allow the chemist to be the most aloof from the work. A smell might kill, a colour usually would not, though perhaps one needs to make an exception for the colour from space by Lovecraft or Octarine by Pratchett. The traditional alchemist and the chemist into the 19th century was much more involved viscerally in the reaction, even to the point of being killed by the chemicals as part of their vocation. 
Common 21st century direct vision methods include noting when a solution becomes turbid or changes colour or takes on a specific colour. Some say that other tests were less precise, but I personally find that it is difficult to check a pool chlorine colour chart by eye against the solution formed from the pool water, so I smell it instead. That, for me, is more precise and direct. The greater visceral involvement, however, continues in the practice of cooking, at least of non-industrial cooking. Wait until the cake is golden brown is common, but so too is wait until a baked cinnamon smell fills the room. Does the cake feel soft to the touch? Or even that modern haram of chemical laboratory, taste the food to see if it is right. Industrial cooking, however, is more like chemistry. The difference between alchemy and chemistry is often one of alchemy aiming for deeper understanding and quality production, while chemistry aims for sufficient understanding and mass production. In a similar manner, alchemical education involves training the intuition from long practical experience, while chemical education involves much more focus on book learning and abstract theory, as well as the heavy use of sophisticated equipment whose operation is not understood in detail by the chemist. The plant Kali in Arabic, which would then be El Kali with the definite article, becomes Alkali in English. This is just as Kemi becomes Alchemy and Kahul becomes Alkahul or Alcohol. It is curious that the Al was dropped from Alchemy while it was not dropped from Alkali and Alcohol. The linguistics justification is just as valid or invalid for each. In modern English, Alkali, the plant, is known as glasswort, as mentioned in Chambers. It refers to a genus of succulent halophytic plants in the family Amaranthaceae. It loves salt marshes, hence it is termed halophytic, meaning salt plant. Halo, as in halite, as in table salt as a mineral. Phyte, meaning plant of a certain kind. Epiphyte is a plant that grows on other plants, where epi means over, above, or upon, as in the word epiphenomenal. Other such words are microphyte, sporophyte, etc. The more formal name for glasswort is salicornia. In particular, the listener might have heard of it as samphire, which is a salt mass succulent, also known as sea asparagus, and is eaten as a condiment. Samphire is believed to be a corruption of the French Saint-Pierre, or St. Peter's herb. However, getting back to Chambers, which stated it was called glasswort because of its use in glass making, it is seen that the ashes of the glasswort, as well as kelp, were used as a source of soda ash, that is sodium carbonate, for making glass and soap. Sodium carbonate has a name that is very similar to sodium bicarbonate, but the former is a poisonous latrine cleaner and the latter is a fizzy material that can be consumed with impunity and settles the stomach. I mention this here because one of the core arguments of Lavoisier as to why he pushed his new chemical names rather than the established chemical terminology was that, for example, butter of antimony is a poison, but butter of milk is not. Hence he claimed that the terminology was impractical. But here we have an example of chemical terminology being as equally misleading. There is probably no terminology that does everything we might want it to do. Finally, Chambers uses the word lixivious. In modern dictionaries, this is defined to mean made from lye, that is, sodium hydroxide. Often in cooking, we say lye, and in chemistry, we say sodium hydroxide, just as salt becomes sodium chloride in chemistry and halite in mineralogy. However, more generally, lye is an alkali metal hydroxide, and in the past it might more readily mean potassium hydroxide rather than sodium hydroxide. They are highly soluble in water. Before the year 1800, before modern elements were identified, the main meaning was in reference to leaching wood ash. So in this sense, lye means what you get if you put burned wood into water or perhaps alcohol, or some other fluid, and then filtering the resulting mess until you obtain a clear fluid. Again, the definition and classification of materials in alchemy is mainly based on the details of the production process, and is very pragmatic. In chemistry, it is based on the abstract theory of elements, and requires much background to convert from the theory to practical applications. 
Chambers states, volume 2, page 464, live, Lixivius in chymistry is understood of salts extracted by lixivium or lotion. Lixivious salts are the fixed salts of plants, etc., extracted by calcining the plants or reducing them to ashes, and afterwards making a lixivium of those ashes with water, whence the name is derived. Mr. Boyle observes that the difference between urinous salts consists in this, that the former change the dissolution of sublimate in common water into a yellow colour. Lixivium, a liquor made from the infusion of wood ashes or any burned substances, which is more or less pungent and penetrating as it is more or less impregnated with salts, and fiery particles abound therein. What is left after the evaporation of such a liquor is called lixivial or lixiviated salts, such as all those are which are made by incineration. Lixiviums are of notable use not only in medicine but also in bleaching, sugar works, etc. End of quote. This leaves us with the word lotion, which also turns up in alchemical and chymical texts. Lixivius relates to salts meaning that they have been extracted by lixivium or lotion. Chambers takes longer to unpack this as it has multiple related meanings. I take the important one to be Chambers, Volume 2, page 473, LOR. Lotion in pharmacy, a preparation of medicines by washing them in some liquid either made very light so as to take away only the dregs or made to penetrate them in order to clear them of some salt or corrosive spirit as the lotion of antimony, precipitates, magistries, etc., or else intended to take away some ill quality or to communicate some good one. End of quote. So, lotion, a general term for material created by washing a solid in liquid or essentially the result of leaching process. In 21st century, lotion typically means an oil and water emulsion and is commonly defined by its use in cosmetics and medicine for treating the skin. A lotion is distinguished by having a low viscosity and a cream higher and a gel even higher. The primary etymological root of lotion is wash. So these two uses may well be reasonable but entirely distinct. So it seems that Chambers is saying that a lixivious salt is extracted by washing ash where extracted by lotion is intended to mean to wash. Extracted by lixivium is similar but specific to ash. In Freund, Lectures on Chymistry, 1704, on pages 13 through 15, there is much said about acids and alkalis. It speaks of the words as being suddenly popular, as of 1700, but claims that there is no good definition. Freund then objects to the terms acid and alkali. He says that while he has heard that they are opposites, he fails to see what they are in any practical sense, he is dismissive of the test that syrup of violets is turned red by acid and green by alkali. Syrup of violets is just violets, the flower, heated in a sugar solution in water. It is said that slow heat is best and that boiling increases the shelf life but reduces the effect. Many people liked the taste and it could be used in cooking. It was also a herbal medicine. It was known to the cooks and the herbalists that adding lemon juice to it changed the colour. Violet, or at least the syrup, contains salicyclic acid, which is similar in its effect to aspirin, acetyl salicyclic acid. It was used for coughs and for headaches and to give a good night's sleep. Birch bark also contains a salicyclic acid derivative. Chewing birch bark was also used for coughs and headaches as well as toothache. The Chambers Cyclopedia defines acid as anything that affects the tongue with a sense of sharpness and sourness and says that a test is whether it turns syrup of violets red, but also states that there are dubious acids which turn syrup of violet red but do not taste perceptibly sour, then defines acid in the broader sense as something that turns syrup of violets red. This is a very common way for things to develop. The human senses make the first division of the material, in this case sour or not. However, different people have different tolerances or perception of sour. A similar effect is common in tolerance to capucin in chili. One person says that they can barely taste the chili and the other person is gasping for water. 
Similarly with the cubit as a measure of length that depends on who measured it. Subjective sourness does not give an objective measure of what is acid or not. Beyond that, something merely being sour is not very interesting in an alchemical sense, if that is all there is to it. The point of classifying acids is that everything that is acid also undergoes other reactions in a recognized pattern, such as syrup of violet color, but also engaging in effervescent reactions and so on. The pattern of reactions is more interesting. If there is something that does act like an acid in the reactive sense, but is either not sour or is too poisonous to use that as a test, then it can pragmatically be called an acid in the broad sense, and the broad sense is what is required other than in cooking. The Chambers Cyclopedia I am using is the first edition published in 1728. The lectures on chymistry by Freund are indicated as being read at Oxford in 1704 with the published edition that I have being from 1737, but declared to be unmodified. Under those conditions, I would consider that the Chambers Cyclopedia is a good source for the theory and terminology background of the lectures. I'm not sure why Freund is objecting to acids so strongly. He is writing about 25 years before Chambers, and that could make the difference, but Freund knows about the syrup of violet test, which seems fairly clear, at least as a definition of acid, that an alkali is something that effervesces with an acid. Page 13 of the Oxford Lectures on Chymistry by Friend says, It may be thought, perhaps, I ought to say something of acids and alkali, words which are now in everybody's mouth, but I cannot see what definition can be adequate for them, as they are pretended to be repugnant and contradictory to one another. I ingenuously confess I am so far from comprehending what these terms really signify that I don't thoroughly conceive what the chymists themselves would mean by them. End of quote. Freund gets so upset in the following pages about how absurd the notion of acids and alkalis are that well one might wonder precisely what he's really railing against. There must be more to it. The Chambers Cyclopedia about 25 years later has no issue with the idea. It seems quite clear and objective. Freund seems to feel that it is a mess of badly defined and unworkable concepts. Part of his objection feels like ill will on his part in modern terminology deconstructionism. For example, he denies the possibility of telling acid from alkali using syrup of violets on the basis that not everything changes the colour of the syrup and some things change it as something other than red or green. This sounds like a petulant quibble. Yes, a solution that already has a colour might obscure the test in the same way that too much carotenoids in the blood can disturb medical tests that rely on colour or colour change. But this does not make the test meaningless or even useless in practice. It means that it has to be used with caution and wisdom. However, Freund also declares that the different writers declare different things acid or alkali in a contradictory manner. Now, this is a more valid criticism if true. Although even there, as on the topic of quantum mysticism in the 20th century, one might be able to distinguish mundane from mystical writers to gain a practical conclusion. Let us consult Robert Boyle, the sceptical chymist. Boyle uses the word acid 43 times but does not seem to define it. Hopefully he honestly felt that people would be familiar with the word, but given the reaction of Freund, this feels less than justified. Indeed, as I read it, there is some justification for the idea that Boyle is confused on the issue, just not negative about it. In general, I have found Boyle to be less precise than some of the other writers, especially those several decades later. There seems to have been a rapid increase in explicit precision of chymical writing at the end of the 17th century. Page 48 of The Skeptical Chymist Commentator, without the addition of anything that is not perfectly a mineral except saltpetre, may, by one distillation in an earthen retort, be made to afford good store of real salt, readily dissoluble in water, which I found to be neither acid nor of the smell of tartar, and to be almost as volatile as spirit of wine itself, and to be indeed of so differing a nature from all that is wont to be separated by fire from tartar, and diverse learned men with whom I discoursed of it, 
could hardly be brought to believe that so fugitive assault could be afforded by Tata. End of quote. To make some sense of this, one needs to know what Tata is. In particular, one needs to know what Boyle meant by the term. A quick web search just gets suggestions on how to remove dental calcination. A more focused search of the wine literature obtains wine diamonds, which are crystalline deposits said to be composed of potassium and tartaric acid and called tartarates. And wine diamonds sounds like a public relations exercise. Volume 2, Chambers Cyclopedia, page 180, TAR. Tartar in chymistry, etc., is a kind of salt which rises from fumous wines and striking to the top and sides of casks forms a greyish crust which hardens to the consistence of a stone. See salt. End of quote. So we're on the right track. Cream of tartar in 21st century literature is said to be potassium bitartrate, KC4H5O6, and is a byproduct of winemaking. It is made from the potassium acid salt of tartaric acid. Tartaric acid is C4H6O6, a chain of four carbon atoms with oxide and hydroxide side groups. A salt is fairly generically said to be the result of a reaction between acids and alkali, or base. This seems to align with the approach used at the end of the 17th century. Acid salts are salts that produce an acid solution when dissolved in water analogously alkali salts. Saltpetre is potassium nitrate most of the time, that is KNO3, so the saltpetre supplied the potassium. I said saltpetre is potassium nitrate most of the time. This brings up an important point in decoding alchemical texts. I have often found that declarations in modern chemistry books that an alchemical term has such and such a specific meaning in modern chemical terms to be misleading. At best, that usually means that the term gradually evolved to mean that. Terms for some metals today were originally applied to a hydrated sulphate of that metal, and then the metal, when discovered, was termed a regulus, especially of antimony. This does not mean, as is often implied, that the alchemists misidentified the sulphate as the metal but rather that they used the terms differently and that the meaning of the terms changed over the centuries. Chambers, Volume 2, page 15, SAL, says, Saltpeter, called also nitre, and by the chymus dragon, cerberus, and salt of hell, a kind of salt either natural or fictitious, of very great use both in chymical preparations, in composition of gunpowder, in dyeing, in glass manufacture, and in making of aquafortis for dissolution of metals. Its minute parts or crystals are in the form of needles, though some will have them triangular, as those of alum are triangular, and those of common salt, cubical. When perfect, they are said to be fistulous or hollow, like capulae. Of natural saltpetre, there are two kinds. The first formed by natural crystallisation of saline sulphurous juices distilling in caverns or along old walls. That is what they call saltpetre of the rocks, and the same with aphronitra of the ancients. The second kind of natural saltpetre is furnished by the water of a dead lake in the territory of Terrain in Egypt, called the Nitrian waters, exalted and concocted by the heat of the sun, much after the manner of bay salt. This is natrum, or anatrum, of the ancients, which our druggists call natron, now little used, but in bleaching of linens, see natrum. End of quote. So it seems plausible that Chambers might have referred to the general location as the territory of terrain. It is noted that in antiquity natron was harvested from dry lake beds in Egypt, Natron and castor oil make a smokeless fuel for lamps used in ancient tombs in Egypt. Exalted means, in alchemical language, something like extracted as fumes or purified. The use of the word fictitious is presumably a printer error. Later chambers use the word factitious, meaning manufactured, in the same context. At this rather pivotal point I must beg indulgence from the listener, saying, to be continued. In the next episode, I'll look in more detail into the justification of Freud in disliking the idea of acid and alkali 
and the declaration by Boyle of an ambiguous salt that is both acid and alkali, as well as the modern definition of acid and alkali that includes amphoteric compounds that are indeed both acid and alkali. I have at this time the resources to make one 20 minute video each week and that takes two days, one to research and write the script and one to construct the video, as simple as it is. I hope that if people can subscribe, like and share to someday, perhaps next year, have an active Patreon account corresponding to this channel. And I'm not fond of the idea of advertising on the videos and I'm against the idea of breaks in the videos. I assure you that the advertisements appearing on some of my videos are supplied without my agreement by YouTube and do not indicate any financial resource for myself. So the more people can like, subscribe and share, the faster that can happen. If you do like what I'm doing, I may be able to ramp this up to one hour per week with better quality of video accompaniment. In the longer run, I hope to set up a workshop and do practical demonstrations. As usual, my sincere appreciation goes out to my audience.